And I understand you got married while he was still in prison, is that right? Yes, yep. we got married, uh, we made the marriage contract on uh, January 7th, mm -hmm. 2013. Yep. And they call us uh, the bride and the groom of the Syrian revolution. <laughs> My guest today is a BAFTA-nominated filmmaker whose documentary work highlights the human stories within the conflicts and current affairs making the headlines. Now, her latest film, Ayuni, follows the search for two of the many, many people who've disappeared in Syria over the last nine years. It's getting a digital release this month, and Yasmin joins me now to tell us more. Yasmin Feda, thanks so much for speaking to us. Thank you so much for having me. Now, as I mentioned, your latest film, Ayuni, examines the loss of two people, Vassel Safadi and Paolo Dall'Olio. Now, they're among the more than 100,000 people who've been forcibly disappeared from Syria in recent years. We're more used to hearing stories about Syrian refugees in camps, those who make it to Europe in the hope of gaining asylum, people who are uh, alive, in fact. Why did you choose to focus on the plight of Basel and Paolo in particular for this film? Um, it's quite an interesting journey, this film, actually. I, I didn't actually intend to start a film about forcible disappearance. I actually started making a film with Father Paolo, who I knew for many years and had actually made my first film with. Um, in Syria in 2004 in his uh, community uh, called Marmusa, which is a monastic community that focused on interfaith dialogue. And after 2011 and the revolution and uprising, he got quite involved and was expelled from Syria soon after. And I decided to make a film about him, actually, in this moment. And so I met with him actually in Paris. He was doing a tour talking about what was happening in Syria, and uh, I did an interview with him. And a short while afterwards, he went to, to Raqqa to negotiate the release of um, kidnapped journalists and that he was never heard from since. And that led me on the journey uh, of understanding much more that there was thousands of people being forcibly disappeared. It was used as a weapon of war. It was targeting civil society activists particularly. And that led me to Basel. Well, for a better look at how you documented that search for those two people, let's take a look at this clip of the film. What do you think about your own safety? Um, I'm, I'm British, to say. But you upload all this material, you get it out to the world. يبدو أن هناك من أخذ موقف موقف ضدنا أبونا باولو للسنين يعني أبونا باولو شخصي يعني يعني يضر Now, given that at one point those people became literally invisible when they disappeared, I presume that presented quite a challenge for you as a filmmaker, filming this absence. How did you approach that? It was a really uh, interesting challenge because it was about trying to find a way to embody what absence means when it's actually really present for people. Because those left behind, uh, Basil's wife, Basil's family, his sister, who I also film um, in this film, um, are dealing with something that is really hard to put into words, to articulate. They don't know if they should grieve, if they should hope, they should wait. Um, and it was really time that took me, it was time that helped me find a way to really like express these difficulties. But at the same time, I think what was unique and I found myself in is I had access to archive both my archive of Paolo, uh, Basil's archive that he had filmed himself or that his friends had filmed, and it gave me the unique opportunity to tell their stories in their own voices before they're disappeared. And I think that's something that helped me give the personal stories a presence so that we felt it in the present uh, rather than just told to us um, after the fact. Now, I believe that the word ayuni means my eyes, but also has the meaning of my love or my life in Arabic. Now, this is a film that deals with current affairs, with war, with politics, but there's a much more personal story there too. How would you describe the emotional dimension of the film? Yeah, it's interesting you pick up on that. I mean, the when you work with something over so many years, I was filming it over six years um, and you know, Nora and Mackie, Paolo's sister, trusted me with their stories, with uh, their loved ones' stories. 
you realize it's really about love. It's about love between a young couple. It's love between siblings. And that's actually the, the thread that I realized really held everything together, that despite it all, that was the way people dealt with everything. And it was also the way that I felt, or I hoped, could make it relatable to audiences anywhere. That's why I chose the title Ayuni. Um, the meaning of my eyes is also got another layer, which is about what the people witnessed in the film. So it kind of has a dual, dual meaning. And in Ayuni, you speak to people who are campaigning, opponents of the Assad regime, um, and they're asked about the risk they're taking by carrying out these activities. For example, uh, the question of whether filming uh, protests is putting them in a certain amount of danger, and if that danger is worth the risk. Now, if I were to put the same question to you as a filmmaker, what about the risk you're taking by working in the Middle East on these projects? What would you say? I mean, I don't think the risks I'm taking are nearly as comparable or as high as the risks that the people in the film. Basil took a much higher risk uh, by filming, helping people take footage out of Syria. He was on the ground and he took a risk with his life in the end. Um, Paolo, the same. Um, they were working on the ground. I don't live in Syria right now. I am working at it from a distance. I am connected. I'm deeply connected, but I don't feel the risk is to the same with me. And I feel that my role, therefore, is to help amplify these voices and stories where I can. This film is not the first time you've tackled the situation in Syria. Your previous film, Queens of Syria, in 2014, focused on a group of Syrian women who were actually living in exile in Jordan, and they found themselves performing in a theatre workshop, participating, rehearsing and performing, and eventually uh, doing a Greek tragedy. Now, you followed that process with your camera. Let's take a look. وانا صغيره حلمي اني مثل كنت زي ما انا مصدقه ان الحلم اللي كان ان انا صغيره انه هلا رح يتحقق بعد ما انا بحكي عن بلدي وما اني حابه اطلع بهالصوره هاي كنت As we can see there, they were working on a production of Euripides, the Trojan women, and many of them had never acted before, never come into contact with the performing arts. How would you describe the effect of that artistic process on those women who you met? That was quite an amazing process to uh, be part of because um, it really changed over the weeks. It was a seven week project. And from the first day, people were like, what is this? I don't really understand. I'm kind of interested because, you know, it was something to do. A lot of people were in limbo, did not have work, obviously were stuck. Um, and this gave something for people to do. But as the weeks went along, uh, people got more uh, confident with their own skills. Um, and also in the project, they started to believe in it. It became a platform for them to share their story, but in a sort of collective way. And it was quite an amazing process of discovery, I think, for everybody, including myself, to see this transformation in actually such a short amount of time. Um, it was great, actually. It was a really, really inspiring um, experience. Now, when we look at the success and the reach of films like yours, of Wade El Kateb's Oscar nominated for Sama, we could say that documentary makers, journalists and artists have never had more success in making compelling work that really resonates with people, gets the message out there. But do you see this work having real tangible effects in the field, in conflict zones or in diplomacy? I really hope it can. It's really difficult for one film, for one piece of art to make that difference. But I think pieces together, little pieces in a puzzle, we might be able to do that. Um, if we can use my film or any of the others you mentioned to create spaces for conversation. I mean, I think that's the first stage of creating impact is a space for conversation, dialogue and awareness um, that can therefore maybe target a, a higher level of diplomacy and advocacy. As a Palestinian, I believe that part of your childhood was spent in Syria. You're now based in London. That's a path that would suggest some family and then professional choices. As someone who has a foothold in both the Middle East and one here in Europe, how would you say that's informed your perspective as an artist, as a filmmaker? 
Yeah, it's an interesting question. I think identity is very complex and it's quite hard to compartmentalize it into one thing. And for me, I definitely feel like I'm part of different parts of the world, definitely part of Europe and the UK and definitely part of the Middle East. And I hope that by making films, I can try and bridge those worlds together. I think film can be a very unique way to get people together in a room. Well, these days in your own home <laughs> to watch films, but to open up dialogues together. And I feel that's what I can try and do. And that's I feel there's a lot of misunderstanding, I guess, between parts of the world when actually there's a lot of opportunity for understanding. And I hope that my art and my films can be a way to bridge those. Now, finally, we asked you what's on your cultural radar at the moment. Yeah. You flagged up the series And She Could Be Next, which I wasn't aware of. That's just started streaming recently. Tell us why we should check it out. It looks really, really exciting. I think um, it's an American series about women's grassroots movements for democracy. And um, I'm always interested in process. And these, this series, it's a two-part series, looks at the process of democracy on the ground with groups of women working uh, in the Democratic Party across the US, a diverse group of women. And I think it's really exciting to see how people are trying to change their communities and their politics um, from the ground up, especially today. And it's really inspiring to see that in the US because it's such a contentious space. Um, and I think we just need to hear those voices. So I'm very excited that this is coming out. Well, that's a great tip. I'll definitely be checking it out. Thank you very much, Yasmin, for speaking to us today. Now, Yasmin's film, Ayuni, is available to stream at the moment, as is that series, and she could be next. We'll leave you with a clip. Otherwise, do come back for more arts and culture here on Encore, and there's more news coming up on France 24 in just a moment. It's about building power in our community to win what is right. Except the communities that need to be brought in reflect the new American majority. They're young, they're brown, they might speak another language. And there's a lot of us. Oh. I'm excited about the fact that women of color are now coming into our own, that we're standing up and taking our rightful place in the pantheon of leadership, that we're changing what the face of leadership looks like. Sur France 24, la nuit, on est très fiers d'accompagner les Amériques dans leur soirée, de voir l'Asie se réveiller, et on est là jusqu'à ce que Paris s'éveille. France 24 est plus que seulement noticias. C'est liberté, égalité et actualité. Nous nous donnons un pas plus loin, avec des informations au moment, pour analyser, comprendre, mettre en perspective et débattre. In Live from Paris, nos correspondants around the world keep you up to date. Mais c'est la nature qu'il y ait la liberté, et surtout la liberté de l'éducation, dans un pays de liberté de l'éducation. Liberté, égalité, actualité.